So what's the problem today? Does God have laryngitis? Has he got a sore throat? Why can't you hear God speak to you on a regular basis? The only knowledge I care a hoot about is stuff that God has spoken to me in my journal. What I figure out with my mind, I consider man's knowledge. So now, if you're not hearing God's voice, and he just said, my sheep hear my voice, then what's the problem? If you're not hearing God's voice, then guess what? You're not of God. He's given you every tool to hear him if he's inside of you. If you're not hearing God's voice, then you need to just ask yourself, am I God's sheep? I heard one pastor say, maybe we should teach him theology for the first six months before we teach him how to hear God's voice. I said, no, you do not separate them from their lover's voice for six months, but you'll fill their head with man's theology. That would be scandalous, all right? I know the voice of Jesus Christ. I know when he speaks to me. There's no doubt in my mind. You want to hear God speak to you? Read your Bible. If you want to hear God speak to you audibly, read it out loud. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Long for Truth. My name is Daniel Long. Sitting next to me is my lovely wife, Rob. Hi, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about the voice of God. Have you ever heard someone say to you, God speaks in a still small voice or God speaks in dreams and visions? Well, we're going to be talking about that today, and we're going to be talking about one particular person in general. This man is very dangerous. He needs to be marked and avoided, and his name is Mark Verkler. And Mark Verkler wrote the book, Four Keys to Hearing the Voice of God, and we're going to go through his teaching. Mark and his wife, Patty, were both raised in upstate New York, both in conservative churches. They met when they both went to Roberts Wesleyan College, also in New York. That is where they both experienced the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They became charismatic and decided to be committed to a spirit-filled lifestyle. They have two children, one of whom is Charity Verkler, and I can't pronounce her last name. I think you K pronounce it KMB. I think that's what, I, what I've heard it, how I've heard it pronounced. Charity has a website <clears throat> called Glory Waves. She does seminars with her husband teaching basically the same thing her father teaches. On her website, Charity states, I enjoy the company of heaven, doing life together with Jesus and his holy angels through visions by day and living into the kingdom of God through my dreams, my visions of the night. We are created in God's image and he is spirit. So we too were made for the supernatural. We, we were created to live into the spirit and live out of it. So they just got done doing a seminar in Taiwan where her husband taught the four keys to hearing God's voice and charity taught Christian dream interpretation and experiencing angels. And if you remember, our angels video is the video where we showed a few clips of Charity talking to right. Sean Bolts. Right. So, so um, the majority of our clips come from a time when Mark was teaching these four keys to the um, church Catch the Fire in Toronto. Yeah, this is the kind of damage that Carol and John Arnott have done to the body of Christ. They have invited so many false teachers into their church, of course, them being false teachers themselves. But they have really just, they're, they're on the fringes of the charismatic movement. They are. Why don't we go ahead and see what Mark has to say about his teaching? All right, so page two is, uh, how are we different from New Agers? We have PowerPoint here, too. New Age has a different foundation than we have. They have a different uh, goal than we have. They have a different process than we have. And um, therefore, we're very, very different. Some people say, well, don't you think that looks a little bit New Agey? I said, I sure hope so. You know, I mean, because how many know the New Age movement is a counterfeit movement? Am I correct? Who are they counterfeiting? The counterfeit? The church, Christian. You know, so... If you don't look anything like them, then apparently there's nothing real enough or valuable enough in your life that Satan decides is worth counterfeiting. So I sure hope you're doing something that looks like a cult group. Otherwise, you need to ask yourself, why aren't I doing anything that Satan fi finds valuable enough to counterfeit? Amen? So I don't back away because somebody thinks it's new agey. I say, well, I, I hope it looks like that because they counterfeit things that are real and have value. That means I'm doing something real and valuable enough for Satan to care, care about. Amen? 
Yeah, no, um, that is absolutely atrocious. I mean, so he's going to tell the people there in Toronto that they need to look like New Agers, Robin. Right. And this is not the first time I've heard this argument. I've heard mm -hmm. other people in the NAR use this as, well, people say we're very much like X, Y, and Z mystics or whatever. That's a good thing. And it's probably not a it's good thing. It's not is a it? good thing at all. It's actually uh, something that we are not to emulate. We are supposed to be different. We're not supposed to look the same as the world, especially New Agers. So in the first clip we have from this teaching that um, happened in 2012, uh, Mark Verkler is talking about the eyes of my heart. I hungered to hear God's voice and uh, didn't know uh, how to hear his voice. I read the Bible through and didn't seem to teach me how to hear his voice. And it's because I was reading it improperly because I didn't really know how to read it. I was reading it as my culture taught me to read it, which was to take my mind and apply it to the word. But what the Bible really says is take your heart and apply it to the world. Word, let your heart instruct your mind and let your heart teach your mind because out of the heart flows the issues of life. But I didn't know anything about my heart or how to define it. And so I didn't know how to let my heart teach my mind. So when I read the Bible, it was just theology. There was no revelation knowledge. When the um, people, disciples on the Emmaus Road heard Jesus unfold the scripture, they said, did, our, did not our hearts burn within us while he was opening scripture to us? And I didn't have that burning sensation. I didn't have the Holy Spirit opening scripture because I didn't pray over it. I, I didn't know I was supposed to. I finally found Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart, say eyes of your heart, would be enlightened. Say that. See, I, you know, I missed that prayer. And I went through Bible college without praying it. I pray that the eyes of my heart would be enlightened that I might know. So, Robin, what Mark Verkler is doing there is he is separating the mind from the heart. He is as if the mind can be separated from the heart. Right. And and reading it improperly because his heart wasn't involved when he uses that verse about um, them saying, didn't our hearts burn within us when when Jesus was saying something? Is our heart supposed to burn within us every time we read God's word? The, and he's taken a passage of scripture that has absolutely nothing to do with hearing the voice of God. Jesus was right there with them, and then he vanished from their sight. He's talking about, that comes uh, from the passage in Luke, um, I believe it's in Luke, on, of the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. Mm -hmm. And when they said, wasn't our hearts burning within us, it was because Jesus had opened up the scriptures to them as he was talking to them. He was showing them from the prophets and from mm -hmm. uh, the law that he was the fulfilled promised Messiah, Robin. And yes. so that was the whole thing. When, when they're saying, wasn't our hearts burning within us? It wasn't because they wanted to have some kind of vision. It was because they had heard the word of God and they had understood what the word of God uh, was when Jesus explained it to them. Yes. And Mark Verkler, and I'm sure you've heard others do this, will elevate the, the heart mm -hmm. and place it in a prominence above the mind yes. as though the two can be separated. We did want to share a few verses with you. Mm -hmm. Number one, about what God's word says about the heart. Yes. Genesis 6, 5, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, but wait, that was right before the flood and God wiped out the earth. And so that doesn't apply to us now, right? No, because when Noah and in Genesis chapter 8 stepped out of the ark, made a sacrifice, this is what God said. Genesis 8, 21, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. So, so I think it's just our nature. Right? It is. It is the human nature. And just because we have, and I've heard Verkler say this, Robin, and I've heard others say this as well. Well, you see, you got to understand, God has already given us a new heart and a new mind, mm -hmm. you know? And yes, he has, but that does not mean we can't be deceived, and that does not mean our minds and our hearts aren't sinful. Right, so you can go through scripture and see how many references there are to the heart and to the mind, and you really can't separate the two. Nope. 
Uh, let's read Proverbs 4, 20 through 27. My son, be attentive to my words. Incline your ear to my sayings. Let them not escape from your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and healing to all their flesh. Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet, then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So, so Danny, in that one, I just see that... It's all interconnected, mm. our heart and our mind and our eyes and what we say and what we hear. You can't separate the heart and the mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mm. soul, mind, and strength. Love the Lord your God with everything. And so these people that are doing this, this is, Robin, honestly, this is how the Gnostics operated back in the day. And even today, yeah. they operated by always looking for this secret way, this mystical yes. way to communicate with God. And that's exactly what Mark Verkler is teaching people to do. He is. Um, in the next clip, he talks about the flow of God. And, and I said, God, how come I live in a culture that can't even define this stuff? I looked up the Bible. I looked in the Bible. There's 1,400 verses on heart and spirit. I looked them all up. But I, yet I lived in a culture that couldn't say, hey, Mark, your heart is sensed as flowing thoughts, flowing pictures, flowing emotions. When I want words from my heart, I tune to flowing thoughts. When I want pictures and visions from God through my heart, I tune to flowing pictures. When I want emotions, I tune to flowing emotions. There was no one who could say that. That word flow came straight from scripture. The Lord finally showed it to me. Out of your innermost being shall what? Flow rivers of living water. This he spoke concerning the what? Holy Spirit. So when you and I want to tune to the Holy Spirit, that verse says the Holy Spirit inside of us feels like what? Feels like flow. Say he feels like flow. Say when I tune to my heart, I tune to flow. Because that's the river of God within me. And flowing thoughts are his voice. Flowing pictures are his vision. Flowing emotions are his emotions, and I choose to live in that rather than living in my own mind or my own strength. Says no biblical text at all. I am not going to say I tune to flow. Um, it, very odd teaching there. Yeah, like I said, it, th there's nothing in Scripture that even implies this kind of stuff. And he's talking from John 7, you know, the, the, the passage that he uses is from John 7. Yeah, why don't we read those verses, John 7, 37 through 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. This passage, and remember what I said, these guys take passages like this that have nothing to do with hearing the voice of God. This is not about hearing God, folks. This if you read this in the context, this is speaking of salvation and receiving and the receiving Holy the Spirit. Holy Spirit and salvation. This right. has nothing to do. This is a thirsting for uh, salvation, not a thirsting to somehow, you know, be able to have visions and hear the voice of God. Right. There's a good um, quote from a commentary we're going to read by Lenski, and he says, he refers to spiritual thirsting, which, however, does not emanate from ourselves, but like the coming and the drinking is the effect of the presence of Jesus, of his call and offer of living water, grace and salvation. He awakens the desire for spiritual satisfaction, even as he also satisfies the desire. Each morning during the seven days of the feast, at the time of the sacrifice, a priest proceeded to the fountain of Shiloh with a golden pitcher, filled it with water, and accompanied by a solemn procession, bore it to the altar of burnt sacrifice, pouring the water together with the contents of a pitcher of wine from the drink offering 
into two perforated flat bowls. The trumpet sounded and the people sang Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, with joy shall you draw water out of the wells of salvation. Hence, Jesus saying in the beginning, um, whoever's thirsty, let him come to me to drink because Christ mm -hmm. is the one who satisfies our desire for salvation. Again, this isn't about hearing the voice of God. Ferkler goes on to say, he can just ask for a vision. I was looking at, I mean, when I look at what happened here tonight, how many think this is kind of like the best of times right here? The best of the Holy Spirit poured out upon us, us touching him, tasting him, feeling him, being changed by him. I looked at Washington, D.C. a few months ago and said, I think it's the worst of times because it's going, we're going to bankrupt the whole country. We're going to bankrupt the whole system. And I found fear and anger. So I don't know, is it the best of times or the worst of times? And when I felt fear and anger, I know what to do. I said, Lord, I'm obviously not seeing you. So I said, Jesus, how do you see Washington, D.C.? And I took the eyes of my heart. I presented them to the Holy Spirit, asked the Holy Spirit to enlighten the eyes of my heart and give me a picture. And a picture flowed into my mind, which was Jesus enthroned above Washington on a throne with light and glory streaming down over the Congress and the White House. Yeah, go ahead. Give the Lord a hand. Amen. How many know that's a pretty nice picture? That removes fear. That removes anger. All of a sudden, I'm back to faith, hope, love, joy, peace, because I saw a vision. I got the vision because I asked for it, and then I knew how to tune to it. Spontaneous pictures are visions that come from the spirit realm. I didn't know that. Years ago, I wouldn't have known to ask for a vision, and if I'd have gotten a picture light up on my mind, I'd have probably dismissed it and said, well, that'd be nice if it was real, but I wouldn't have really believed it, all right? Okay. That is not the biblical way that people have visions. You don't try to have a vision. When you look at you visions. You don't ask for God to send you a picture. You don't ask for God to send you I a picture. I don't think That's Ezekiel did that. And yes, that is new age. You, nowhere in scripture are right. you commanded to do this. Visions, when they came, they just came. Scripture doesn't show people sitting in a quiet place picturing uh, God in their mind and then asking him to show them a vision. That's not how it worked. The vision came. I think about Peter, for example, in uh, Acts chapter 10, when the sheet came down and Peter saw the, the, the sheet, all he was doing was praying. He wasn't expecting a vision. The vision came. Mark Verkler and those that practice this kind of thing, mm -hmm. they are trying to have visions. Right. And, and they live for them. Uh, another thing that, of course, is concerning is the spontaneity of it all. He mm. continues to use this word throughout his teaching that spontaneous pictures mm -hmm. are those that come from the Lord, spontaneous thoughts, or the thoughts are the thoughts from God. Yeah, yeah. And I guess if if you analyze your own mind or your own thoughts going through, you know that most spontaneous thoughts are not those from God. No, and not at all. And And, and then he says that you know god gave him this vision of jesus because he was wondering what's going on lord are you in control what's happening right. so god gives him this vision of jesus over washington dc or wherever it was right. and showing him that god is in control why didn't he just read the bible the bible makes it clear that god is in control he's sovereign he's so. sovereign over the nations and that's all in scripture so why do you need a vision for that he goes on to talk about his personal theology of thoughts and the next thought that came and said, Mark, you spent 10 years in diffused effort. You didn't get through. If you spent one year in focused effort, say focused effort, and you got through, it'd be the best year of your life. I said, that's true. Now, those spontaneous thoughts that were coming to me, you want to take a wild guess where they were coming from? God. They were coming from God. But at that point in my life, I hadn't said this sentence. God's voice sounds like spontaneous thoughts that light up on my mind. Can we say it together? God's voice sounds like spontaneous thoughts that light upon my mind. I hadn't said that. I didn't have a theology for thoughts. I just figured the thoughts are in my head. That makes them mine. God said, no, 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 no. You're hollow on the inside. You're a vessel. And much of what's inside of you, it's not you. It's the one that fills you. And right now you're filled by the Holy Spirit. So much of what's in you is the Spirit giving you stuff. It's not you at all. And the thoughts that are yours are the analytical ones where you say, Mark, figure it out. The thoughts that are the Holy Spirit are the spontaneous ones where I fix my eyes on Jesus, ask him to give me his thoughts. I tune to spontaneity and flowing thoughts begin to flow in. That's his voice. 
and the thoughts that come from demons are when I've got my eyes fixed on something evil and I get some nasty thoughts that line up with the names of Satan, accuser, adversary, thief, all right? Uh, those are coming from demons. So uh, now I've got a theology for thoughts. I can break them into three categories. Spontaneous good that line up with the names of the Holy Spirit, comforter, counselor, healer, teacher. Spontaneous evil lines up with the names of Satan. And analytical, which come from me building them, connecting them one after the other. So Mark Verkler just said that God's voice sounds like spontaneous thoughts that light upon my mind. And I think, number one, where in the Bible does it talk about God being just spontaneous thoughts? It doesn't. Folks, when God spoke mm. to people in Scripture, he just spoke to them. They knew it was God. It was clear. It wasn't uh, some kind of, oh, God, is this you or is this not you? Okay, I better check with Scripture to make sure that my thoughts are lining up with the Word of God. No. When God spoke, he spoke clearly, and the people that he spoke to knew that it was from God. Right. And of course, just differentiating again between the mind and the heart. Mm -hmm. So my mind will analyze, but my heart is there to receive these spontaneous thoughts, which are from God or from Satan. And we know Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful and desperately sick above all things. But what does the New Testament say about the heart? Matthew 15, 18 through 20 says, and this is Jesus talking, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a person. And this is what is in the human heart. Christian or not, our hearts are deceit, deceitful. Of course, we've been given new hearts and new minds. That new heart, though, is a heart that desires to obey the Word of God. It's not a heart that is sinless, and it's not a heart that cannot be deceived. Otherwise, the book of Galatians would not even be in the New Testament. Paul would not have had to straighten out false doctrine in Colossians or in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. Folks, we can be deceived. We can. Uh, Verkler, where does he get this theology? I went to conferences on hearing God's voice. None were being offered by the, the church that I got saved in because even though they did, they did stress lordship and, and that was great, they did not stress the voice of God. They kind of believed that when God finished writing this, he quit talking. And I said, yeah, but I have an ache to hear him. They said, you'll get over it. <laughs> well, I didn't. I got over them instead and I, and I moved and uh, looked for another church that really were, was hungry for this. And uh, so the Lord, he took me to conferences outside of my theological background. How many have all gone outside of your theological background to learn something new? If you have, would you say amen? amen. How many found that kind of scary? Yeah. Scary, because I, I was taught the only people going to heaven were the ones in our church. Uh, I was pretty conservative, but that's what I was taught, all right? And I've had to go from there to realize, hey, there's a whole lot more people than that going to heaven, all right? So uh, anyway, you'll never guess where the Lord took me to learn some of these keys to hearing God's voice. He took me to a Catholic charismatic retreat center for a week uh, to listen to two Jesuit priests, Dennis and Matt Lynn, who taught on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And I had read their book entitled Healing Life's Hurts Through the Five Stages of Forgiveness. And uh, it was a beautiful book on inner healing way back in the 70s. And I read that book and said, these guys can hear the voice of God and they can see vision. I said, I'm going to call them up and see if they can help me because nobody around me can help me. And even though they're Catholic, who knows? They might know something. <laughs> Okay, so folks, when you're listening, if you are listening to Mark Verkler, if you um, are enjoying his work, a lot of the stuff that he's teaching you is coming from Catholic mystics and Jesuit priests. And if you are dissatisfied with Orthodox teaching and you are searching for something different, you're going to find something different. Mm -hmm. We're going to look for what we yes. want. And that is what we're going to use. And Absolutely. that is what he did. He was not satisfied with orthodoxy. And and something else, too, on, on that same line, when people are searching for the voice of God apart from Scripture, because God does speak, we believe. Danger, danger, danger. Yeah. We believe God speaks today. I believe that you can hear the voice of God 100 percent of the time, as long as you are opening up the word of God, because where does God speak? 
he speaks through his word. He, when you are reading the words of scripture, you're reading the very words of God. And people that are um, like Mark Verkler and are teaching this kind of heresy, it, they are not satisfied with the Bible. The scripture isn't sufficient. The Bible isn't sufficient. They need more. They need to hear something. And it reminds me of Jesus calling and of God mm -hmm. calling and, and all of that. the rhema word. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so key one to hearing God's voice is getting in a quiet place. So Habakkuk or Habakkuk said, I'm going to stand on my guard post, keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And the Lord said, record the vision. All right, let's go forward to PowerPoint. In the first key, I'm going to stand on my guard post. One more PowerPoint, please. Key number one is that you want to have a, a quiet place to go hear God's voice. Quiet yourself down in God's presence. He called it a guard post. You can call it your soaking room. You can call it your prayer closet. You can call it living room couch where you sit down and just soak in the presence of God. Any place you can get along to, alone to become still. Now, half of my mind knew that. Half of my mind was scared to death to, to do that. Because I was taught that if I would still my mind, guess who could move upon it? If you've heard, tell me. Satan. Satan. So one half of me is saying, mind, be still. The other half is saying, don't you dare become still because Satan will get you. How many know with that kind of inner tension, it's going to be difficult to still my mind. I'm not totally convinced it's right to still my mind. Is it right to still your mind or is it wrong to still your mind? I think it's right, because the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. And then Psalm 62, David says, be silent, my soul. He talks to his soul and says, become still. So it is okay. It is okay. So this fear I have of Satan, how many believe that fear is nothing more than faith in reverse? And I really hate fear because I really, I don't want to put faith in Satan. And really what I had was faith in Satan. I said, you know, I believe that if I quiet my mind in God's presence, I believe Satan's going to get me. And God says, uh, you know, according to your faith, be done to you. And if you're going to believe for Satan to get you, guess what's going to happen? Satan's going to get you because you empowered him with your faith in him. So when Mark Verkler talks about stilling the mind, what we have to remember is he's not talking about kind of sitting in a place and relaxing. He's talking about literally shutting down your mind because the mind is where the analytical thoughts come from. And you don't want analytical thoughts because that means those thoughts are coming from you. You want spontaneous thoughts, right. which is and the spirit. That makes sense to think that that's how he's thinking because otherwise I have never heard, even in conservative circles, the idea that it is a bad thing to quiet your mind, that that's inviting Satan in. Now I have heard opening your mind mm. or closing your mind, but to quiet your mind, we should be doing that every day before the Lord. So should we worry about Satan and being deceived? Absolutely, because the Bible makes it clear that the devil is an angel of light. He's going to look like the real thing. And so you know, Peter says that we're to be on our guard. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone that right. uh, that he can devour. So us being concerned about Satan is not empowering him mm -mm. and putting our faith in no, him. No, as Christians, we we should be aware of of uh, the fact that because we of our hearts being sinful, mm -hmm. we can be deceived. So Second Corinthians eleven thirteen through fifteen. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness. Their end will correspond to their deeds. Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Again, we have to ask those who are listening to the teachings of Mark Verkler and others who teach this, even Henry Blackaby, how do you know what you're hearing is coming from God? And think about the hoops that people have to jump through to find out, okay, am I hearing from God? Okay, does it match scripture? And they have all of these different uh, qualifications to know whether you're actually hearing the voice of God. Although I do think they get to the point where they just think that, yes, this is from mm -hmm. God, because I just had this spontaneous thought and it's not bad. So it's got to be from God. Right. Oh, okay. Uh, Verkler goes on to talk about picturing your theology. 
and let's go forward to PowerPoint. So the Lord showed me key number two, which is, hey, Mark, use vision. Take the eyes of your heart. You have eyes in your heart. Look in the spirit realm. See what's there. And particularly what you ought to do is fix him on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So how far do I have to look before I find Jesus? Anyone know how far away he is? <laughs> we sang about that quite a bit tonight. Where is he? Right here. He's Emmanuel, right? God with us. Amen? He's sitting in the chair next to you with his arm around your shoulder. If you believe the Bible says that's true, would you say amen? amen. Now, if you believe it's true, is it okay to picture that? Is it okay to think that? Yeah, I think it's okay to think it or picture it. But I think if you picture it, you're going to be further down the road because we say a picture is worth what? A thousand words. So I would rather picture my theology than just think it because I think pictures are the language of the heart. Whenever the Bible mentions the word heart, uh, uh, pictures, it always, it, uh, it always talks about imagination of the heart. It never says imagination of the mind, imagination of the heart. It puts picturing as a heart faculty. Now I looked up all 1,200 verses on heart. Because I wanted to know, I want a definition. I thought, well, okay, there's some definition. One of the faculties within my heart is the ability to see. I have eyes in my heart that can see into the spirit realm. We've called it all sorts of things, imagination, picturing, visualizing, dream, vision. Those are all outworkings of use of the eyes of your heart. I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened, to say enlightened. So, Robin, he is taking Ephesians chapter 1 out of its context, first of all, it has, again, these, the, they do this, these verses have nothing to do with hearing the voice of God. And when Paul says that we, uh, you know, that he prays that the eyes of our heart be enlightened, he, he's basically just saying, he's not saying that we have eyes in our heart. He's saying that he's praying that we can understand who Christ is. And Again, so he separates our physical eyes mm -hmm. with seeing with the eyes of our heart, which he says, see into the spiritual realm. Yeah. They're not just like, if I were to hear eyes of my heart, I would think, oh, my spiritual understanding mm -hmm. of what God's word is telling me. Exactly. So do you want to go ahead and read Ephesians 1, yes. 16 through 23? I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he work that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named not only in this age but also in the one to come and he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all so that's verses 16 through 23. Keeping the, that chunk of scripture within its context, what did Paul talk about in the very beginning of the chapter? He talked about election, the fact that we were predestined for salvation in that chapter, did he not? All of this is a salvific passage. It's talking about the salvation and the blessings that Christ has given us in our salvation, that it was all three persons of the triune God who plays a part in our salvation, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And if you read verse 1 all the way down through here, you'll see that that's what Paul is praying for. He's praying that the eyes of their hearts would be enlightened to know those things, to know Christ, to know what Christ has done for us. And um, just the fact that picturing would be a faculty of my heart separate from my mind. Again, yeah, separating the heart and the mind, yeah. saying that, you know, it's just, he, he talks about New Age copying us, but what is actually going on is they are copying New Age. That is what Verkler and those guys are doing. They are copying New Age practices. He now talks about how he can create things. Pictures are powerful. 
pictures produce heart faith. Let me prove it to you. When the father of faith, Abraham, the father of faith, when God established faith within him, here's what he gave him. He said, see the stars of the sky. What is that? See the stars of the sky. He just, he, God just gave him what? A vision. He gave him a vision in a vision. We're talking Genesis 15. He's in a vision, and then in this vision, God said, see the stars of the sky? He said, you're going to have that many kids. That's a promise with a picture. And you know what the next verse says? Genesis 15, 6 says, then Abram believed. Would you say those three words? Then Abram believed. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Abram believed because of what? A picture that God implanted into his heart that he could look at, and it inflamed faith. Say, pictures inflame faith. Say, pictures are worth a thousand words. And that passage demonstrates it. It does. If you want a passage of the Bible that says it, I think that's as good as one as, as any. I want heart faith, because heart faith can cast them out in the, in the sea. Heart faith can heal my body when it's sick. Heart faith can heal my marriage when it's sick. You know, and I've had to do both of those things, because I've been sick and God said, no, I want you to see yourself healed. My marriage was under stress. He said, I want you to see you and Patty uh, fulfilling one another and wondrously happy. Because if I see that, say that, speak that, and believe that, guess what I get a chance to create? The miracle. And if I see something ugly, guess what I get a chance to create? That miracle. But it's a nasty one instead of a good one. Okay, we have word faith theology mixed with new age visualization in that clip. And Danny, what about his comment? Like, if I have enough faith in my heart, I can heal and I I just don't understand that. It's a word of faith theology, because remember what he said at the end. He said, if I have, yeah, uh, you know, a, a bad vision or if I have bad, you know, thoughts, then I'm going to whatever what I'm thinking is going to produce right bad things, you know. So, again, it's it's word of faith theology. It's it's new age visualization that's going on there. OK, so he goes on to talking about vision all the time. All right, so if you want to say this, uh, godly imagination is picturing things the Bible says are true. Okay, and I'm into godly imagination. You've got to picture something. Your eyes are there for some reason, all right? And um, then I stepped. I started this vision out with a godly imagination. I pictured something that was true. And I asked the Spirit to take it over, and I stepped from a godly imagination into a vision. When the scene came alive and Jesus gestured, it was no longer a godly imagination. I stepped into a vision. If you see that, say, I see that. All right, so let's say this sentence. I can step from a godly imagination into a divine vision. And I think we find examples of that in Scripture. I think John did it in Revelation chapter 4. He said, I saw this door in the sky. And uh, then the next verse says, oh, and the Spirit kicked in. And when the Spirit kicked in, I wasn't just in the sky. He took me to the third heaven. So I think there's an example of he's picturing the door in the sky, which he got from the previous chapter, because the previous chapter, Jesus was knocking on the door of his heart. So he opens the door up, steps from there into a vision, which goes for about 15 chapters. So I think there's examples in Scripture. I've learned to do that. I do it all the time. I do it when I worship. I picture myself in the throne room. I picture the throne room here, and we're all just worshiping. And I step from there into flow with the heavenly host. And I think we can all do it all the time. Got to do something with the eyes of your heart, and I can't think of anything better than to do that. Jesus saw vision how much of the time? Jesus said, I only do those things that I see the Father doing. How often is Jesus seeing vision? If you believe all the time, would you say all the time? How often do you think you and I should see vision? All the time. I'm going to say something that's going to offend. I know it is, but this is so stupid. You want to talk about taking Bible passages and literally turning them upside down on their heads. That's what this guy does. I can step from a godly imagination into a divine vision. And so when Verkler mentions John and the book of Revelation that John used this technique, I guess, in chapter three, he is in a vision and Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock, right? Mm -hmm. 
And then in chapter four, John sees a door open in heaven and Verkler says, see, he was using that imagery to get into the vision. What? <laughs> Like I said, it's it's like how how can you be take a passage of scripture like that? That is just a clear example of Isa Jesus, man. It is turning a passage like that on its head. It means none of what Verkler says it means. And if we are to believe Mark Verkler, Jesus was having vision mm, all of the all time. The time. And the Bible doesn't say that. This is Mark Verkler trying to force his theology into the Bible. Mm. And if we are to believe that, then we believe that John initiated that. Yes. The vision in Revelation. Yes. Peter initiated his vision of the sheet coming down. Yeah. Right. Uh, so it just yeah. does not fit in with what the Bible actually says. We don't try mm. to have visions. New Agers. They try to have visions and no one in the Bible was trying to have a vision when they had a vision. No, no. Let's move on and talk about key three. So key number two is to learn to use vision. Key number three is what he will speak to me. One more PowerPoint, please. Key number three is that God's voice often comes as spontaneous thoughts. Let's say it together. God's voice often comes as spontaneous thoughts that light up on our hearts or our minds. Well, man, a spontaneous thought's a really simple definition for the voice of God, because I didn't know I was supposed to listen for spontaneous thoughts. I was listening for a booming bass voice, which I've only heard once in 60 years. So if it's a spontaneous thought, how many of you know everyone in this room hears God's voice every day of their life? And even he didn't hear God's voice, because God gives, he, how many of you know the Bible says he's Lord of all? doesn't just say he's Lord of the righteous, he's Lord of all. And how many know he gave his dreams and visions to evil kings as well as to his children Israel? Amen? What Mark Verkler just said makes it sound like every single person walking the face of the earth right now can hear the voice of God within himself, mm -hmm. that God is sending him messages in his heart. Right. And God does speak to the, un, uh, to the unsaved. He speaks to the wicked. But how does he do it? through general revelation. Exactly. Right? So yes. Psalm, one, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 4, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. So God is mm. constantly speaking to non to non Christians in general revelation through creation, and that's what beautiful Romans verses, one says. and that's a beautiful psalm. Mm. Um, and in Romans one verse twenty, for his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. And they know deep within that God exists, uh, even though they suppress that knowledge. Right. Uh, Verkler does state that it's OK to experiment with hearing God's voice. Is it OK to experiment with hearing the voice of God? If you think so, say amen. If you're not sure, say I'm not sure. <laughs> See, I was taught if a thing is worth doing, it's worth doing how? Well. But here's the truth, you don't do anything well the first time. You go through a period of trial and error and mistakes. And if you're not willing to let yourself make mistakes and do something poorly for a while, how many of you know you'll never be able to do it well? Is that right? You see, so I, I had to say, Mark, it's okay to make mistakes. It's okay to go ahead and experiment, explore, and if you make some mistakes, that's perfectly fine. You're in a learning curve as you're mastering a new skill. Okay, Robin, you can experiment with some things cooking cooking youtube channels gardening yeah things like that you don't experiment with trying to hear the voice of god that is so dangerous what that is so crazy and you think about god's voice number one is he ever going to garble a message or 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 be wrong so that you need to perfect or hone your skills no if god wants you to hear his voice he is almighty he is sovereign you will hear his voice you know this reminds me of the nar prophets yes 
who say, you know, in the Old Testament, you had to be a prophet and get it all right. But now you don't necessarily have to do that because God's message could get mixed in with your subjective experiences and your mind might be elsewhere. So maybe that's where he's going with this. But yeah, he's it's not he's, biblical. Yeah, not at all. No. Not at all. No. OK, where are we? We are going to talk about being hungry and ready. And, you know, when they ask you what you do, you could say, well, one of the things I do is teach people how to hear God's voice, because you might do other stuff, too. But you could at least say one of the things I do, you know, and those who are hungry and ready, their ears will pick up and they'll start asking you. And those who aren't, that's fine. Just be a friend to them and that'll be good. Someday they will be hungry and ready. Amen. Yeah. Because how many believe that the hope for the world is to teach people how to live out of the spirit? There is no other hope. I mean, religion is not going to get us there. Hedonism, humanism, rationalism, there's nothing that will get us there other than spiritual intimacy. And how many know we really need all of us working together to establish that in everyone that we come into contact with? And that can help continue and usher in the next wave of the revival. Amen? So Mark Verkler just said that the hope for the world is to teach people how to live out of the spirit. The hope for the world is the gospel of Jesus Christ, mm. not teaching people to live in some kind of subjective experience with the Holy Spirit. And there is no other hope. That no. was bothersome. Very to, much to so. To say the least. Um, why don't we go right to the next one? Yep. When somebody asks you how to hear God's voice, please don't tell them, oh, you just know that you know that you know, because if they knew, they would not be asking you how to hear God's voice. Tell them something helpful. And I'd like you to memorize this sentence. I'm going to have you repeat it after me. This sentence is on those free cards out there on the table, wallet size cards. Here's the sentence. Repeat this after me. Hearing God's voice is as simple as. Quieting yourself down. Fixing your eyes on Jesus. Tuning to spontaneity. And writing. Okay, can you say it with me this time? Let's try it with me. Here we go. Hearing God's voice is as simple as quieting yourself down, fixing your eyes on Jesus, tuning to spontaneity, and writing. One more time with me with the hand motions. Here we go. So those are the four points with hand motions. <laughs> but hearing God's voice, nowhere do we hear that we should look to God's word. No. And as a matter of fact, if you watch this video and you watch it from beginning to end, he rarely even quotes scripture. I mean, he takes the passages that he wants that will fit his theology and he'll quote some of them. I haven't heard many references or maybe a couple here and there, right. but he makes them repeat his phrases from his book. That's what they're repeating as, you know, as if that's on par with scripture. Um, he does go into more detail about journaling. So let's see what he has to say about that. Now, if you've never journaled before, I'm going to give you one exercise to do, which I'll explain right now. And if you have journaled before, I'll give you those of you a second exercise to do if, if you want to do a second a different one but for those who don't never journal before the best place to begin is a two-way love letter between you and the lord where you write one paragraph and please limit it to only one paragraph where you tell the lord god jesus here is one of the reasons i love you so much because of what you've done for me and after one paragraph i'd like you to let him write the second paragraph and tell you about how much he loves you and i'd like you to specifically be using the eyes, using the four keys, picturing Jesus right there with you, arm around your shoulder. Or if you want to go sit by the Sea of Galilee on the ground, that's fine. Get into a comfortable spot with him. Comfortable, which doesn't mean hanging on the cross next to him. All right. Some people do that. And I say not comfortable. All right. We're looking for comfortable. All right. So don't go there, please. All right. He's not there anyway. He's resurrected. He's in heaven on a throne. He's not on the cross. All right. So please don't go there. So um, picture Jesus with you in a comfortable setting. I want you to picture Jesus. I want you to tune to flowing thoughts. And, what, and he's going to say, my child, my daughter, my son, is going to call you by name. I love you too. And he's going to tell you how special you are. And as those flowing thoughts come, I just want you to write in simple childlike faith. Don't test them. Don't analyze them. Just write a paragraph. 
When the paragraph is done, then you can go back and test and analyze, but not while you're receiving it. Because if you analyze and test while you receive it, you cut it off. And journaling lets you stay in faith till the whole flow is done because you can test it later. So no testing during this seven or eight minutes that we're going to be quiet before the Lord. And um, so it'll be a two-way love letter. For those of you who have never journaled before, done two-way journaling, two-way love letter is what I'd like you to do. For those of you who have journaled, I'm going to give you a couple other options. Uh, if you can do the two-way love letter or you could say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? Or Lord, what do you want to say to me about healing and strengthening this relationship in my life with this person? Or Lord, what do you want me to be focused on right now uh, in my life? Or Lord, where do I need a breakthrough in my life? And what do you want to say to me about that breakthrough? Or Lord, where, where am I bound and where, and where do you want to get me unbound? Those would all be possible questions for those of you who have already have been journaling for a while, okay? So your journal is far more important than the Bible. <laughs> Asking God to tell me how much you love me, God. How about opening up the Gospel of John and reading that? How about opening up Romans? How about opening up the New Testament? Opening up the Bible and reading what Christ has done for us to save us. I, I immediately just thought of John three sixteen for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And that's where God tells us how special we are and how much he loved us. Yeah, and when I when I li listen to his whole teaching on journaling, this guy is like Jesus calling on steroids. I mean, he is like I, everything that, I mean, he's literally saying, write this down, this is coming from God, just like Sarah Young does, write this down, this is coming from God, and he also talks about taking it to people and showing it to people. That whole automatic writing thing, like what makes you think that just because you're writing about how amazing you are, that that is coming from God? He gave <laughs> us that in his word. He gave us how much he loves us. He does. He tells us everything we need to know about his love in his word. He doesn't go above and beyond that. And you don't have to hear some kind of special ooey gooey vo voice to tell you how much Jesus loves you. Just open up his word. One of the things he talks about is he says, when you write in your journal, email what you've written in your journal to leaders trusted leaders who you know can hear from God and then ask them, is, do you think this, or is this the voice of God? Did God actually say this? Isn't that like asking Chuck Pierce if what I just <laughs> prophesied sounded <laughs> accurate to him? Yeah, that's it. That, that's, it's akin to that mm. for sure. Um, and so the journal, this journal that you're writing in, it's, above scripture it's something that is placed above scripture even and though they wouldn't say that they would not say that but no. that's exactly what they're doing and it's scripture that is to be the standard right second uh, timothy 3 16 and 17 says all scripture is breathed out by god profitable for teaching for reproof for correction and for training in righteousness that the man of god may be complete equipped for every good work equipped for every good work. Folks, you don't need to journal. You don't need to sit in a corner and listen uh, for the still small voice of God. You don't need to try to have a vision. Mm -hmm. This is just all subjective, new age teaching. Mark Verkler is a man that needs to be marked and avoided. So thanks for watching. Bye.